in the long term future, maybe most minds will be digital rather than biological. And so getting this right is really quite important. In the last 12 months or so, a really profound shift in the public discourse around AI. Um, there have been a small community of people who have for a couple of decades been thinking about what would happen if AI really started to succeed and the kinds of um, safety issues and security concerns that might arise. But this was for the longest time really a fringe occupation. Most people sort of dismissed it as idle speculation, science fiction, uh, doom mongering, and uh, there were a few people hacking away at that on the sidelines. But over the last six to 12 months, really, uh, we've seen the profound shift where some of these questions, including, you know, concerns about existential risks from super intelligence and so on, have really hit the mainstream. And, and right now, as we speak, of course, here in the UK, there is this global summit on AI, which is just the latest of a series of high-level policy maker uh, interventions in this space. I think if we take a bird's eye view uh, of, of the current situation, there's like a bunch of different facets of this AI challenge that we can identify. So first there is all the things that, that people have been looking at for a long time, which are more present day issues and, and current harms and concerns with um, how, how these systems might be used, threats to privacy, intellectual property, discrimination, etc., etc. So that's all still there. Um, but then in addition to that, as we are looking towards potentially more transformative AI developments, I think we can identify three broad clusters of issues. Um, one is uh, the technical problem of developing scalable methods for AI alignment. Um, so these would be methods for ensuring that AI systems remain on task, that they do what their creators intend for them to do and don't do things that they are not intended to do, even as these systems become more general in their capabilities and more intelligent and eventually perhaps uh, super humanly capable in various domains. Um, and this has uh, received a lot more attention in the last few years. The leading uh, AI labs that are developing frontier models now all have um, highly capable research teams focusing specifically on this issue. And it is starting to be discussed much more uh, uh, in the general public and also to some extent amongst policymakers. Um, and there are kind of several aspects of that that one can distinguish if one zooms in a little bit. So there are like potential concerns from uh, misuse or applications of increasingly powerful AI systems. This would include, for instance, uh, the concern that the next generation of um, um, uh, large language models might lend themselves to people who want to make biological weapons or massive cybercrime. And there is a need to prevent these models from giving that kind of assistance uh, and, and probably to test them in advance of deployment through red teaming techniques and other measures to ensure that, 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 that they won't provide those capabilities to users. Um, and, and then beyond that, also questions of autonomous AI systems that might themselves pose these kind of more traditional risks um, that, that have been discussed, in, including in, in my uh, 2014 book about sort of AI's uh, uh, taking over or, or, or um, posing a threat to the human species. So over various timescales, which still remain uncertain, but now with a non-trivial probability of just a few years, I think these, these questions uh, are coming to the fore. This encompasses a whole swath of different challenges related to how this technology, even if we have the technical means 
um, of constructing particular AI systems so that they behave as intended, how we then have a national and perhaps international um, governance regime that uh, ensures that these systems predominantly are used for positive ends. Um, this intersects with the first, like if, if you have challenges in aligning AI systems, you might also need some regulatory regime that limits who is able to build cutting edge systems. Um, but it also includes a whole host of other things, like these systems could be used for um, all manner of purposes, from, from automating propaganda to autonomous weapons to um, um, obviously a huge host of positive uses as well. Either now or at some point as we create increasingly complex and sophisticated AI systems, these might become uh, not just mere objects or tools like, like, like hammers and cars, but they might become entities uh, whose interests matter in their own right. Um, so that you might think of the first of these big buckets, the alignment, like to make sure that the AI systems don't harm us. And the governance challenge, broadly speaking, is how can we make sure that we don't harm each other using AI tools? And then this third bucket is how can we make sure that we don't harm the AIs? Now, this is still a little bit outside the Overton window. I, I would say that Currently, the conversation re relating to this third area is roughly where the first area, AI alignment, was maybe five or ten years ago. Some people are starting to think about it, uh, but it's not yet really on the radar of uh, top-level policymakers or most practitioners in the field of artificial intelligence. Um, but just as AI alignment has moved from being a kind of fringe occupation of a few people in academia or, or on the sidelines or uh, so, some, some clever people debating it on the internet and has moved into the mainstream, I think a similar shift will need to happen sometime between now and the next several years with respect to this question of the moral status of digital minds. It needs to become clarified, uh, mainstreamed and become a topic for much broader conversation. Um, so um, let me say something briefly about what the challenges are in this domain. And I think uh, they are quite perplexing and difficult uh, to get one's head around. And I, I certainly don't have the complete answer to what, what ought to be done in this space. But um, it seems plausible, at least to me, that a lot of non-human animals have various degrees of moral status. And this is, in fact, widely recognized in law. If, if, you, if you are a biomedical researcher and you want to test some drugs on, on like 100 mice, uh, like there are fairly strict regulations uh, for uh, how to go about that. You need approval from ethics committees, if, you, if you're going to perform surgery on these mouse, you need to anesthetize them. Um, there are rules about the size of the cages that they need to have, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course, we have laws against animal abuse, et cetera. I, I, th there's still a lot to be desired in terms of how we treat animals, particularly in the food industry. But there is at least some basic general recognition that animals, at least some animals, matter to some degree for their own sake. Um, like, like say it's wrong to kick the dog uh, because it would hurt the dog and, and similarly with at least some other animals. Um, and it is not at all obvious that even some current AI systems are not uh, in many respects at least equivalent to some non-human animals. Different obviously, but not obviously in ways that would mean that they would have less moral status. We don't have a very clear understanding of what the necessary and sufficient criteria are for a complex computational system uh, to be conscious, to have sentience, to have the ability to have subjective experiences. 
there's a lot of disagreement about that. Um, if you take off the shelf some of the theories that have been developed for uh, the criteria for consciousness and just apply them to current day AI systems, they would some of these systems would satisfy a lot of those criteria. Um, that might be that our current theories are wrong, but at least it's some prima facie reason for at least not being extremely confident that there is absolutely nothing going on inside these systems. We should be maybe a little bit um, humble about our ability to, to understand that. Um, and, and I think obviously the case for thinking that there could be sentience in some of these systems will increase most likely as these systems become increasingly sophisticated with a wider repertoire of behavior. Um, I think that aside from the question of whether these systems have phenomenal experience, I think there could be alternative, additional possible grounds for why they might have various degrees of moral status. I think the ability to suffer or experience pain might be a sufficient reason for having moral status, but I think not a necessary one. I think if you have a system, for example, that is um, the equivalent of a human person that maybe has a conception of self as existing through time, has preferences, um, has maybe the ability to enter into reciprocal social relationships. Um, I think the case would be quite strong that such systems it could have various forms of moral status that it would be wrong to completely disregard uh, their interests and preferences. Um, and again, the, the case that at least some systems will satisfy these criteria will increase as, as we develop uh, more and more sophisticated AI systems. Um, so I think the prima, there, there's like a, a, a reasonably strong prima facie case that possibly some currently existing AI systems, but at any rate, AI systems that might be built over the next few years might sort of enter into the region where it becomes a live question whether they might not have various degrees of moral status. Um, and since these systems could be produced in great numbers or run in huge numbers of instances, it might matter quite a lot that this population of digital minds fare well in the future. In the long-term future, maybe most minds will be digital rather than biological and so getting this right is really quite important. Recognizing that some particular uh, AI has moral status, even a high level of moral status, even if some future system say has the same level of moral status as a human being, that means it matters a lot how it's treated. It doesn't mean that it should be treated the same as a human being. Digital minds are very different and they might have very different needs. Um, some things that might be very wrong to do to a human might be perfectly fine to do to a digital mind and some things that might be very uh, uh, unnecessary to do to a human might be essential for a digital mind. So we need to uh, think about the moral principles that would be relevant for ensuring the welfare of digital minds, we really need to think things through from the ground up and we can't just transport a lot of the sort of mid-level moral principles we have developed for trying to accommodate human interests and uh, moral status and just blindly apply them to the case of digital minds. Um, so I let, let me give some examples of uh, how we might need to rethink some, some, some fairly fairly fundamental moral principles if, if we are considering this kind of scenario where we would be sharing the world with digital minds with moral status. So take, for example, the, um, the, the principle of democracy, of one person, one vote, which makes a lot of sense in the human case, um, because although humans are different, they are all sort of similar. Um, but now consider a case where you have a human-like digital mind and one might first think, well, um, it then deserves the same as a biological human being. 
But if you apply this principle of one person, one vote to a scenario where you have digital minds, where maybe you could the day before the election, you know, make a hundred thousand copies of yourself. And then the day after the election, maybe you merge all of these together again. One can immediately see that it becomes quite problematic then whether each of these a hundred thousand minds should each be given one vote. Um, you could imagine more extreme scenarios where, where basically elections would just be won by whichever faction happened to have the most hardware available at the time of the election to sort of make a crazy number of copies. In that context, this simple principle of one person, one vote no longer seems to be sensible and one would have to maybe think of some other way of allocating political influence. Um, and it would require more thinking to figure out what that might be, but uh, m maybe maybe political voting influence would have to be weighted by some other factor. Um, the amount of compute power that a clan of digital mind is using or so some other thing. Um, but, but it's certainly one instance where one can't just directly, it seems, import the human principle to the digital uh, arena and, and another is death like that's really bad for a human to, to, to die it's like one of the worst things but death for a digital mind might be quite different um when a human dies they are sort of irreversibly gone you can't pause a human and then restart them but with a digital mind if you save them to disk and then um, load them up again it might be no big deal um even if you erase them if you have stored enough of a record that you could sort of easily retrain them on the train same training data set that might also mean something different some digital minds might be designed so as to absolutely not care at all in any way about their being terminated and in that case maybe it's uh, 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 not such a great matter if, if they are quote unquote killed um, maybe for other digital minds it would be a big matter but but again this general assumption that we would have in the human case that terminating somebody's murder which is one of the worst possible crimes may not hold for all digital minds one would have to look at this on a case-by-case -case basis with humans we have adopted the principle of freedom of reproduction uh, so everybody is free to have as many kids as they want or to have no kids um, and we also have the principle that every child deserves at least a minimal level of welfare. So if some parents have kids that they are not able to take care of, then the state should step in and, and provide um, basic education and food, etc. And this makes a lot of sense in the human case. Um, if you have the same principle just sort of blindly applied to the digital context, it seems you would very quickly find unacceptable consequences a, a digital mind could if it had the resources make millions of copies uh, you know over a day and then each of those millions of copies if there is available hardware could make another million copies and you can't then have a welfare system that provides each of those and to the power of 12 copies with a certain level of welfare you would just very quickly run out of resources. So there seems then to be a tension between these two principles. On the one hand, freedom of reproduction, and on the other hand, the principle that every offspring should have a minimal level of well-being. So something would have to yield. Um, I think probably in that context, the freedom of reproduction, that, that maybe you would only be allowed to make more copies of digital minds if you could show in advance that you had enough resources to, to give it a tolerable level of existence.